All right, good Thursday. It is the day after the debate. We're still here in Alabama breaking it all down for you. What a show ahead for you right now. We've got reaction from Governor Christie. We spoke to Vivek Ramaswamy. We spoke to Governor DeSantis. And I've got an amazing panel to break it all down. So much to get to. Thanks for joining us. Let's get into it. All right, folks, it is Thursday. We are still here on the campus of the University of Alabama. I think about matriculating. I've got to find somebody who finds out if I can still get in. This is a beautiful place to be, but uh, I think this is probably our last day here. A big thanks to the team at News Nation who has helped us put this off. What a professional crew. And not just this show, what a debate last night. Hats off to them. Not just the folks in front of the camera, but behind the camera. I made a comment about this last night. I helped put these together in 2015 all over the country, various networks. What a class act, top-notch professionals. This network, it was reminded to me last night, is about 1,000 days old. To put on a caliber of event like this doesn't happen overnight and with people without people who are the best in their field. So kudos to News Nation for doing this. I was proud to be part of it. We did an amazing job, both pre-show and post-show, breaking it all down for you. Uh, I do want to say Val, uh, one of our longtime guests, He was watching last night. He's watched the show. I appreciate it, and I apologize. To the folks in Nevada, I'm learning. I'm getting there, okay? My apologies. I'm a work in progress. I'm on step eight of my 12-step program to say your state's name correctly. Val keeps me honest. Thank you, Val. I appreciate it. Just a reminder that I do read the comments and the emails, but thank you for that. I'll keep trying. Big show today, as I said. Uh, We're going to get reaction from Governor Christie. We caught up with him in the spin room after the debate to give us his analysis about what he thought he did last night and needs to do going forward. This morning, I caught up with Governor DeSantis. Then I sat down, or I actually stood up, the whole time I stood up with Vivek Ramaswamy, got his take not only on his debate strategy, uh, but also what he needs to do in Iowa. It was a big, big night uh, for the candidates. Did they move the needle? We're gonna find out, as I said, I'll get the candidate reaction and then we'll talk to our panel and find out what they thought I want to know what you thought also, so drop me your comments. Let me know both on YouTube, on Rumble. Uh, you can text me. You can go into the VIP group. I want to get your feedback about how last night went. Did people do well, but also did they move the needle? Uh, we've got a lot to weigh in on. I want to start it off with what Governor Christie said about his performance in the spin room last night. Here we go. Nobody ever trained me for Hurricane Sandy. It didn't come in some governor's training manual. And when that kind of crisis happens, or what's happening in Israel, or what's happening when Ukraine comes. The sort pithy answer that's memorized and given to you by your staff doesn't solve the problem. And I think what I showed people on that stage tonight is there's the only one person up there who has the experience and the willingness to take the heat that the presidency will be, and by the way, that the campaign against Joe Biden will be. Um, You you went really hard at Ron, you went really hard at Vivek. What about me? You're saying now that I said it up there tonight. I, I said she's she's not answering the question on whether Trump's fit. She's not answering the question as to why she raised her hand and said that she would support him even if he's a convicted felon. None of them on that stage tonight talked about his conduct. They acted as if this trial that's coming up in, in March isn't even going to happen. I mean, look, that's why I said tonight. Can we stop pretending that the four of us are the only people in this race? I mean, at least the moderators asked some Trump questions tonight, unlike what's happened in some of the earlier debates. But in the end, my criticism of Nikki is very clear. You can't be everything to everybody. And so if you're going to try to do that, you're going to get caught up in it. And you didn't see just me pointing that tonight. You saw Ron pointing it out um, as well. And so, you know, that's Matt, what I was up to tonight was to say, like, enough already. We're at a small enough stage. We have enough time to make your points. I felt like I had enough time to make my points. And I don't think there's any viewer who's watching this where if you guys reported fairly, we'll hear afterwards about who was the truth teller on that stage and who was willing to take it on. And by the way, I would defend Nikki Haley every day in the week on the charges that that guy was making against her. She is a smart woman. I don't think she should be president. I disagree with some of her positions on issues, like Trump and trade and some of those other things. But to sit there and try to pretend that your three-year-old son knows the map better than Nikki Haley is disgusting. And by the way, I agree. I think he does have a woman problem. 
I absolutely do. I think he has a woman problem, and he's insulting her on a personal, intellectual level. I've known her for 12 years. I campaigned for her in 2010. I was proud to do it. I campaigned for her in 2014. I was proud to do it. And the fact of the matter is that she is a smart woman. She's wrong on some things, and I don't think she's ready to be president, but don't insult her intelligence. Uh, All right, it's interesting. I think his comments mirrored his performance last night, right? He was clearly trying to differentiate himself uh, as the one guy that's gonna take on Donald Trump. I just don't think it's gonna move the needle. It hasn't so far. Yes, he's doing okay in New Hampshire, but let's face it, 10 or 11% isn't gonna win New Hampshire and probably isn't gonna propel you much further than that. Uh, but he was very clear in his post-performance that's what he really wants to be known for, and antagonizing going after those other three candidates uh, was his strategy last night. I just, as I said a moment ago, I don't really think it gets you very far. Even in New Hampshire, it's clearly not working. And you saw Megyn Kelly start the debate off with that last night, asking those candidates about electability. All right, folks, I want to tell you about a doctor out of Texas that is got no ties to Big Pharma whatsoever, and he is sharing a breakthrough medical discovery. He has created a series of all-natural products that will help boost your health in a variety of ways, including strengthening your bones, easing joint discomfort, minimizing wrinkles, and improving digestion, all by working in harmony with nature and your body's God-given resilience. There are no chemical or weird additives in any of these products, just proven ingredients that actually get results. All users are reporting significant improvements in just a few weeks. Every order is backed by a 365-day money-back guarantee. So you can get products like this, magnesium, collagen. There's a whole series of them if you go to getnativepath.com slash Spicer, and you can claim up to a 45% discount with my code GETNATIVEPATH nativepath.com slash Spicer. Like I said, a whole series of these all natural medical products. Don't miss out on this opportunity. If you're ready to embrace a healthier, more vibrant you, that you want stronger bones, you want more mobility, especially as you start to get older, I know what that feels like. So again, head to getnativepath.com slash Spicer and get access to a variety of these really healthy, healthy products. Later, I had the chance to uh, talk to DeSantis. He was sitting down this morning. I got his reaction about how he did and how important Iowa is to his make or break campaign. Here's what he had to say earlier. Good to see you. Oh, man. How are you? Hey, good good to, to see you. Just tell me, how did you do last night? What do you think? And is it going to move the needle? It was great. I mean, I think that uh, you, know, you continue to have a smaller and smaller debate stage. And I think it's going to get even smaller when we go into to January. And that's ultimately, uh, you know, what, what we need. I mean, you know, to have seven or eight candidates what was not going to be was not going to work. You know, you get it down to, uh, to, to one, two, or three, then, then we're in business. You want to debate again, just you and Haley, maybe? I would do that 100%. Yep. And, and just to be clear, you said last week on Meet the Press, Iowa, you're all in. You got to win there? We are going to win there. Um, I think that that gives us a, a springboard, but I think that we have a plan where you got to compete all across the country. You know, the goal is to win a majority of the delegates. People have won Iowa and, and doesn't and haven't won and vice versa. So, uh, but yeah, as you know, these things are dynamic. Um, and so anytime you can do something like that, um, it, it, it creates uh, momentum and whatnot, but but we are going to just keep accumulating delegates. That's what you got to do. All right, Governor, be safe. All right, clearly nothing different than he said a couple days ago. He believes that Iowa is make or break, and and that's it. With all the money that, that super PAC has poured into Iowa on the ground, if he doesn't come out a really close second, I don't know how he goes on to New Hampshire. I mean, that's where it all is right now. He's put all that money. We're talking tens of millions of dollars from that super PAC on the ground in Iowa. Um, We'll see. He's very confident, and I think he has to be. They've put all that money down there. It's like going into the casino and putting it all on red or black. You're walking away saying, if I don't win, I'm out. Well, that's where he is right now. We had a more in-depth conversation with Vivek Ramaswamy about his performance, his strategy, and how he has to do in Iowa. Really interesting. Take a listen to that. Good morning. Good to see you. Wow, you are up early. Yeah, it's all right. I like to be up early. Are you an early guy? I'm an early and late guy, both. I mean, you, how late were you up after the debate last night? Probably about one. Yeah, I saw you doing a bunch of the interviews. And then what time did you get up this morning? About six. Is that a normal? No, about like 5.30. Did you already, yeah. Don't tell me you already worked out. Not yet. No, no, no. We'll see, <laughs> if, we, see if we get that Not in yet. before we head out of here. All right, how was your night? How'd you do? I think great from my vantage point. Yeah. I think that we got the truth out on the table on a lot of things that the media is refusing to touch. And I do think that if you want somebody who's going to speak truth to power and take on the deep state, Start with somebody who's going to speak the truth to you. And I okay, think that's so what, what I'm doing. Okay, so what, what was the moment, the issue that you were glad got covered last night? There are a few things. I think that 
going into the hypocrisy of a neocon establishment that wants to send your sons and daughters to go fight in somebody else's war, the fact that many of those proponents from Chris Christie to Nikki Haley apparently don't know the first thing about those wars that they want you to fight for. What provinces of Ukraine are we even going say, head over heels so to go what after? Was it, did you, were you ready for that? That province question, I was wondering afterwards, just as yeah. a political geek, yeah. I was like, okay, was that something... I looked at it as the goal was to say, you're the foreign policy expert, Nikki Haley. Yep. Tell me three provinces. Did you go into the debate with that or was that something you thought of on the fly? I thought of it on the fly, okay. actually, because it occurred to me, you could see she was she was a little bit off kilter. She's somebody who actually two debates ago uh, said that she feels dumber every time I speak. Right. And so I thought of actually going after her a little bit for that. But I thought, let's think literally. I understand why she feels dumber when I speak. So let's just put this on the stage okay. because she, her knowledge is totally missing. And it's not just her. It's an intellectually bankrupt philosophy where the people who want to send you to give taxpayer money and send our sons and daughters to those foreign wars, the ultimate farce at the end of it is they don't even know the first thing about those wars. Right. That's really what the actual, that's really what the actual farce that the whole thing is all about. Yeah. I mean, one of our, uh, Alabama, I'm sure he was just getting back from the debate. Yeah. What did you expect her to say? Did you think she wasn't going to know those provinces? Uh, or, or did I you just think, I mean, that's, that's one if she example. she spouted it out, would that have been a surprise to you? It would have, I would have been surprised. Yeah. But I wouldn't have been, I mean, it wasn't just that. It's the fact that these people have a total absence of real foreign policy vision or grounding in history or understanding of really even, I mean, I think it's, <laughs> It's interesting. I don't know how many more presidents in U.S. history she would have named when asked about the U.S. presidents she admire as well. What I've learned is I've gotten to know these people in depth. They are practiced puppets reciting political slogans handed to them. I mean, you've lived in that world. Yeah. You know what these traditional politicians are like. I, I didn't expect this coming in as a newcomer to this process. These aren't people with actual views. They're just reciters of slogans. And I think the public deserves to see that. But the people who are the most bloodthirsty advocates of continuing this war in Ukraine don't even know the first thing about it. So let me so ask you one example. One, one there's some other things yeah, I think one, we accomplished one of the things last that's night as well. One of the things in debates that was always an old school tactic was tell me how much a gallon of milk costs. The idea is you want to see if someone's relatable, that they've been in a mm -hmm. supermarket. Tactically speaking, I think that was the foreign policy equivalent of that. Okay, Nikki Haley, name three provinces since you cite well, your foreign policy. Well, but it's one policy. step more than that, though. It's somebody who is touting their own foreign policy experience. So it's like the gallon of milk would be if somebody says they're an expert in milk cartons, and then they're an expert in knowing what the, right. the winner from the price is right, and right. that's my qualification to run the economy. That'd be a pretty bizarre basis to run for president. But if it was, it would be especially damning if you did not know how much a carton of eggs cost or how much a cart of milk, how much a gallon of milk costs. So I and and so it's that backdrop. Somebody who has been touting her foreign policy credentials as her prime basis for running for U.S. president and also favoring these foreign wars that I believe haven't advanced our American interests, revealing herself, I think, in so many fronts, not to know the first thing of what the hell she's talking about, I think is one of the many farces of a bipartisan establishment. I said it wasn't just true of Nikki Haley. Right. It's true of Joe Biden. I said that on the stage, too. It's a bipartisan foreign policy establishment that doesn't know the first thing about what they're advancing. But I also took the time on stage not just to talk about the other candidates. I think there are certain unspeakable realities that you're also the media won't really feed you, but is an absolute hard truth now based on evidence that we have from January 6th to the realities of what a Democratic Party immigration policy is really all about in their own words. These are things that the do you media think you spend enough speak. time. Do you think you spend enough time? I, the thing that continues to amaze me in these debates is how much time. Look, I am a Republican through and through. You would make a much better president than Joe Biden, Chris Christie, Nikki Haley, Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis. Hell, the two, that guy that just got escorted by us would probably make a better president than and the Joe average Biden. person off the street. Right. Certainly would. But I, I cringe sometimes on the amount of red on red that we do to each other With versus debates. I get it. But my yeah. point last night was that I sat around watching what happened the other day on Capitol Hill with these Harvard presidents. I look at what's happening in Ukraine, yeah. in China, all over the world domestically, here at our, our border with the number of Chinese migrants, uh, military-aged men lined up. And I'm going, are we spending enough time prosecuting the case against Joe Biden during these debates? What's the mix? Well, I would say that's up to the moderators. And I also- no, it's also up to but you. I, but I also think from my vantage point, it's about drawing a contrast with other candidates. It's is what this primary process right. is about. After that, you're going to go after Biden. But I think that there's a deep ideological divide in the GOP that we can't just paper over. 
I think that there are greater similarities between Joe Biden's foreign policy and Nikki Haley's and Chris Christie's foreign policy than there is between mine and Donald Trump's policy. Right. So I think that I think that that's Donald Trump and I have similar foreign policy. Nikki Haley, Chris Christie and Joe Biden have similar foreign policy. But just because we're running the Republican Party doesn't mean that we're the same on how to deal with this war in Ukraine. So I think some of these ideological divides, Sean, go deeper than just partisan ones. I'll give you another example is on free speech. Okay, I think that there is a pro censorship movement within the Republican Party. Take a look at Nikki Haley's own policy to say that every American, if they're using a social media profile, if they're using social media, has to have government issued ID tied to that profile. Jack Smith, and I've criticized Jack Smith for this under Biden in the Trump case subpoenas from 2020, has subpoenaed any American who dared to like or retweet a post from Donald Trump. That's authoritarian. But the only thing more authoritarian than that is saying that each of those users should have had government issued ID tied to their social media profile. That's Orwellian. That's fascist in the United States. So I don't care if you call yourself a Republican. That's not red on red. That's just authoritarianism versus freedom. All right, guys, are you tired of wasting your money on testosterone booster products that don't work? I don't blame you for that. That's why our sponsor, Eugenics Total Tea, is allowing you to get a free sample just like this. You get a free to try it before you buy it if you text 231-231 and enter code SPICER. 231, 231, and then just enter keyword Spicer. You will get to try it before you buy it. And Nugenics Total T has Testafin, right? This will help you turn black the clock and re-energize your life. Don't take their word for it though. That's the beauty of this. You get to try it before you buy it. Text 231, 231, and just enter Spicer and you get your free sample. You'll get more passion in your life, more energy in your life. It's the number one doctor recommended brand and the number one selling testosterone booster brand at both GNC and at Walmart. Uh, It can help re-energize your life, get you back in the powerful, confident, good looking warrior mode that you used to be. And I know you used to be that way. So now you can go text 231-231 and you get that complimentary sample. But here's the thing, you will also get a complimentary sample of Nugenics Thermo X, their newest and most powerful fat burning incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you lose stubborn fat. So go to 231-231, text that, enter keyword Spicer. Texting though does enroll you in recurring automated messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. It is the number one doctor recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2022. This is way off topic of the debate. I I don't want to get lost in this, but you are a businessman. You are very active on social media. You just brought up this issue. How do you think Elon Musk is doing running Twitter? I think he's doing a great job. The first step is you got to get in there and is the private sector equivalent of draining the swamp. It's an interesting fact is he fired, I don't know, 75% of people. But but from a business perspective, uh, he's telling advertisers, I don't want you. I believe you use the phrase, go F yourself. Yep. As a pure, as a businessman, is he going to do what it takes? I get philosophically as a conservative, I think he's doing great to bring think, back free speech. I think one of the ways you build great companies, and I have been proud to build multiple companies right. myself, multi-billion dollar companies, and Elon Musk is probably the most successful entrepreneur in the world. One of the ways you build great companies is to have a well-defined mission, a worthy mission, and then do everything in service of that mission and how you build the company. Yeah. And I think he has done that. I don't think Twitter had a clear mission before. I think it does now under his leadership. I think sometimes in the short run, you're going to have to make some trade-offs to create that long run value. And I have full confidence he's going to do it. But I also think that every organization needs to define its own mission. Right. And the U.S. government, the U.S. federal government has completely failed and abandoned its mission of protecting right. and preserving the liberties of Americans here at home. So in some ways, what Elon did to Twitter, that's what I'm going in to do the federal bureaucracy. 75 percent right. headcount reduction. Count me in. 50 percent of that we can get done within the first month actually shut down agencies and bureaus that should not exist, revive the integrity of a mission. Our founding fathers made it easy for us. The mission statement is the Declaration of Independence and the operating manual is the Constitution. So they may, as an entrepreneur, you have to create that from scratch. We don't need to create that from scratch in this country. Our founding fathers gave us the mission statement and the operating manual. All we need to do is actually have presidents and elected leaders who can follow it. And so, it's been a long time since we've had leaders who have I think sworn the oath to the Constitution with the intention of actually keeping it. My my basic presumption is if you want to swear an oath to the Constitution, read it. 
Donald Trump is the best president we've had in recent history. But if you look over the last four decades, other than him, I think that you've had a bunch of political insiders that have made really bastardized versions of what this country was founded on. I'm going to bring back that founding spirit. As I talked about Thomas Jefferson last night, my favorite president, someone I look up to. He was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. And I think if he were alive today, the advice he'd be given us in the Republican Party is go with somebody with fresh legs. Go with somebody who can, yes, be bold, take some risks, speak truth to power, not just when it's easy, but when it's hard. Go with somebody whose best days in life are still yet ahead so that you could see a country whose best days are ahead of itself, too. That's so, why I'm in this race. So let me get back to foreign policy. One last question on this, because I thought it was interesting about your comments last night were how you want to approach Ukraine, right? Here's why we don't need to be involved in Ukraine, right? You made yep. a very in interesting case there. But then you were the only candidate that said that if Taiwan was attacked by China, it's in our strategic interest to defend it. Why? What, For the foreseeable explain, future, yeah. Explain the juxtaposition there. Well, one hard answer that's just a quick answer I can give you is that we depend on Taiwan for a modern way of life. And if people don't know that right now, they should. But you could make the, the case that in Ukraine, no, 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 I, I, I get it. very specific. Okay. People understand. You, you probably know this, Sean, but I, but so that anybody who's listening to this really understands what I mean. That's not metaphorical. The little semiconductor right. chips that power our phones, that power those lights over there, the refrigerators cars. in that restaurant, those cars we're looking at, literally our modern way of life depends on Taiwan for our modern way of life. And if China is has an economic gun to our head to say that our entire modern way of living, we'd be third world nation without access to those leading edge semiconductors from Taiwan, that is a major problem for the United States right. of America. And there's no similar case even close to be made for Ukraine. That's a good starting answer. And we could go much deeper right. than that. But that's a big difference between the but, two. But, but I can already, I mean, U.S. policy right now is strategic ambivalence, right? So that the second, what you said right now, just if from a foreign policy standpoint, is provocative towards China, right? And, and so I, I've provided what I call strategic clarity instead of strategic ambiguity. Right. And I do think that strategic clarity is how we stay out of World War III. History teaches us that world wars start not because nations want to enter them, but because they accidentally trip red lines when everybody was vague about where they stood. I think we're closer to World War III than we've ever been in oh, my I, lifetime. I, look, I'm but and so I think that moving to strategic clarity is important. So what I've said is at least for the foreseeable future, at least for the foreseeable future, until we've achieved semiconductor independence or otherwise, we will defend Taiwan. And then after that, we can resume strategic ambiguity, which is the status quo. And so, yes, I think it's going to take somebody with an actual vision for our foreign policy. Part of that ending of the war in Ukraine is I've also said I would use that to weaken the Russia-China alliance, pull, chi pull Russia out of its military alliance with China. The Russia-China military alliance is the single greatest threat that we face. That would be one of my requirements with Putin to end that Ukraine war on mutually agreeable terms is that we weaken, if not end that Russia-China alliance. So this is what we need in our foreign policy is actual vision. And this goes back to the debate last night, because for the entire debate, you know, from the Mike Pence's to the Chris Christie's to the Nikki Haley's to much of the left wing mainstream media, they've derided me compared to those candidates for the lack of foreign policy experience. And I think we proved on that stage last night definitively that foreign policy experience is not the same as foreign policy wisdom. Right. If anything, our history teaches us for the last 25 years that actually those with self-professed foreign policy experience are the ones with the absence of the real wisdom. Donald Trump, in that sense, I mean, he's the president who kept us out of major right. wars and grew the economy. He was an outsider that came in without that alleged foreign policy experience either. And I applaud him for that. But I'm now the leader from the next generation. You get to be now I'm the outsider in this race. And I think it's going to take an outsider with fresh legs to take that America first movement to the next level. And I think that the farce of that neocon establishment was really exposed as the emperor who has no clothes on that stage last night. So foreign policy obviously dominated a lot of the talk last night. Iowa is the first state, 40 delegates at stake. I think a lot politically at stake for, yeah. for these campaigns. We've talked about that in the past. How much do you think the voters of Iowa, the roughly 200,000 people that are going to go caucus, care about foreign policy as an issue that they're deciding you versus Nikki Haley yeah. versus Ron DeSantis versus Donald Trump? I think they care about the United States of America and making sure that we're actually protecting our homeland. Yeah. And so in some case... The fact that we're talking when about you're, these you're distant everywhere, wars. You're everywhere in Iowa. When I talk to people, yeah. they'll say, that guy did more events than I've seen anyone. But yeah, do, well, how much does that come up? I think or it do comes you up, bring it up? No, 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 no. I think it comes up a decent amount. I think it comes up a decent amount. But I don't think people care about the exact individual details of this particular thing in Armenia versus Ukraine versus knowing that we're going to have a president who's going to prioritize 
keeping Americans safe here at home. And when I tell them we would sooner use our own military to secure our own border than somebody else's border halfway around the world, that gets rousing applause every time. Yeah. I think a lot of issues that Iowans care about are being ignored as well. I mean, I've met Iowa farmers, and I mentioned this in my closing statement last night, who are about to have their land taken by eminent domain to run a carbon capture pipeline in favor of a new global climate change cult that, frankly, the Republican Party has been too meek on. So I think I'm the only candidate right. taking on issues like that one. But I think people also care about basically understanding that you have a president who's going to downsize the federal government to meet our national debt issues so the next generation isn't loaded with $34 trillion in national debt, that you're going to have a president who grows the economy, the rising inflation, rising interest rates combined with the stagnant wages. That's what's really leaving people hurting. It's time for a CEO in the White House. And I think that I'm the only person on that stage last night, certainly, who's been a CEO, who understands deeply how the economy functions and how to grow this economy. And also somebody, I think people are hungry for that new generation with fresh legs to lead us forward. That doesn't just mean being young. I think Ron DeSantis tried to bring that up as a contrast with Trump. I think you can be older in years and younger in spirit. I think Trump and I are the two America first candidates in this race. That is the future of the Republican Party rather than chasing the Dick Cheney philosophy of the past. But I do think that it does help as well to be somebody who has not only fresh ideas, but fresh legs to go along with it. That's the combination I'm bringing. So let's get into style and tactics for a second. Last night, you held up a sign that said Nikki equals corrupt. It went nuts on the internet. Uh, A lot of folks afterwards in the grassroots conservative movement were all Vivek, 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 crushed Mm -hmm. it. There were older folks making commentary on television that thought it was a little over the top, a little unprofessional was one of the words, amateurist was another. Walk me through just your tactics stylistically. Why why that approach? Why And who do you think you're appealing to when you do that? So I'll tell you something about me, Sean, for better or worse. I'm not a guy who thinks through how is this going to appeal to one particular base versus not. I'm sharing my honest reactions, and I am being unvarnished with the people about telling them where I actually stand and what my true convictions are. And so my long run strategy is that that's actually what's going to be rewarded over the long run. You were a CEO. I think people are sick you were, and tired of fake politics. You, yes. you you successful companies. If you had done that in a in a would you would but you the role's use different the, here? The role's, okay, the role's so you, you would never different. do that as a CEO. No, I mean the role of a CEO is you provide products and services to people who you need have them employees and make a profit while you're at it. Exactly, and you lead those employees in service of that mission. But in this domain, we have a government that has just systematically lied to its people for a long time because politicians have been hiding the ball on what their own convictions are, if they even have convictions. And for me, I'm the opposite of that. I'm not a politician. I have deep, deeply held convictions. Most of them are popular, I think, with the Republican base. Some of them may not be, which they require. My job is to persuade them of those views and bring them along. And I think in many cases in this race, we have been. I'll remind you, I said this on the stage last night. I was against the Ukraine war before it was popular to be against the Ukraine war. We've persuaded many people in this country by revealing the truth of what that is. Well, I'm also against corrupt politicians. I think that Biden is corrupt. I think that Hunter Biden's $5 million bribe from Ukraine is not unrelated to Biden's foreign policy to fork over money to Ukraine. And I think that the fact that Nikki Haley has a military contracting firm and has joined the board of Boeing and used her connections at the UN to go from being broke to having enriching herself is not unrelated to the fact that she's biased towards foreign wars. So I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, man or woman, and I do think that this is one of the dynamics in the mainstream media right now. They play with kid gloves if you have two X chromosomes, especially if you're going to be controlled by the media. Speak honestly there. I don't play with those same kid gloves. And so I'm not going through the calculus of what's this going to do my polls tomorrow. Otherwise, you get a bunch of plastic politicians like the ones that you see in traditional politics. I'm going through what are my convictions? What needs to be said that other people are not saying? Do I have the guts to say it? Yes, I do. So let me go out there and actually tell the people the truth. And I I think if you want someone who's going to take on that deep state, if you want somebody who's actually going to end the corruption, not talk about it, it's not going to be done by somebody who's just going to be playing with kid gloves or doing what the polls tell them to do. It's going to be somebody who acts on their own convictions and sees this through. And so what did I demonstrate on the debate stage last night? I'm not going to spare anybody who's on the wrong side of an issue, and I will praise anybody who's on the right side of an issue. I recognized, you know, other candidates, Ron DeSantis in certain instances where he was on the right side, and I'll recognize him where he's on the wrong side of certain issues too. You need somebody who's going to speak the truth. The government has lied to its people. I said this last night. January 6th is looking increasingly like it was an inside job. Look at the videos, at least a part. The government 
letting you people in. Those Capitol I mean, you Police. Up a lot last I mean, a great replacement theory is not some made up right wing conspiracy theory. Just look at what much of the Democratic Party has said in the last 10 years. It's basically a description of their immigration platform. And I think that that does deserve to be mainstreamed in a way that people can see that for what it is. There's a reason why, Sean, I'm the only person on that stage who's able to say those things. The other people are bound by commitments to the establishment and the people who control them in the Republican Party. And frankly, some of those people aren't even in the Republican Party. You look at Reid Hoffman, one of the top donors to the Democratic causes is George Soros Jr., funding some of those lawsuits, including the efforts to keep Trump off the ballot, we now learn is one of Nikki Haley's top supporters. So again, I don't I don't believe in this. Well, but isn't that red on red? Well, if you have a bunch of hard blue controlling that red from Larry Fink to Reid Hoffman, the people who want to keep Trump off the ballot, funding Nikki Haley, then no, I don't believe in this philosophy that no, you're not supposed to touch that because somebody just puts an R after their name. That's how we will destroy not only this Republican Party, but this country. And to take somebody who's going to be independent of that classical partisan thinking to say that this is this country we care about. The America First agenda is bigger than black versus white. It is bigger than just classical red versus blue. I think most Americans in this country are with us in this America First movement. There's two America First candidates in this race. That's Trump and myself. But I think right now I can go further with that agenda than anybody because we can reach. You just saw it in that restaurant there, the next generation people with fresh legs. And that's what it's going to take to take this movement you know, to the in next order level. To, last question here. In order to reach that next generation, you have to get out of Iowa. How many tickets out of Iowa are there and where will you be? I think there will be a solid three to four tickets out of Iowa, but I think we're going to shatter expectations. What's that mean? Well, what it means is the expectations have been sent really low for for an outsider candidate like me. I think the polls do not capture but many there, of our there supporters. Are Christie's not running in Iowa, right? So it's Trump, DeSantis, I mean, Haley, and you. I mean, I mean, Christie's on the ballot. He's not going to do well yeah, in but Iowa. But he's not even better. But I think, I, think, I think coming out of Iowa and New Hampshire, this is going to be a narrowed field, and I'm definitely going to be part of it. That's what we're going to see. But so, and that's I mean, going to exceed Iowa, expectations. Don't you have to beat somebody? Yeah. So you, okay. So you I have, think we're going to deliver a... Here's what I'll tell you, Sean. Yeah. We will deliver a major surprise in Iowa. The expectations that are set by the polling and the mainstream media narrative now we're going to shatter that. And I think that's going to be- but Give me a number. You're a businessman. Just all I want- Yeah, but-, but I mean, like, I, If you have I, to do I'm more not, than 10%. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a businessman, but not some sort of but somebody political walked into an horse race said, analyst. Hey, boss, uh, we're going to have a great quarter. I think, we'll, I think we'll be in the double digits in Iowa handily. Okay. Handily in Iowa. All right. Double digits. No be problem safe. with that. Thank you for Thank being you, with man. us again. I appreciate that. Thank appreciate you very it. much. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Now I want to get our panel reaction. We're going to be joined by Breland Holland, who is the editor-in-chief of the Truth Gazette and the chairman of the Alabama Republican Party, John Wall. All right, let's break it all down with the panel. Chairman of the Alabama Republican Party, John Wall and Brylan Hollihan. Good to see you both. Yes, sir. Good to be here. All right, Chairman, I'll start with you. How did last night go? Well, I, you know, it's, it's, I've been asked that question a lot. And I think, I'm sure you have. I, I, I think what we saw on stage was a lot of passion. Um, I, the word I use, if I can describe it in one word, is spirited. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there's conversations afterwards. What, one of the guys I was talking to last night said, well, I would have used aggressive. And I was like, you're in Alabama. Sure. We, we talk, you know, we, we use polite terms. You guys might. Yeah, they're, they're, none of them were from Alabama. <laughs> look, 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 look. In Alabama, we call aggressive spirited because that's just what oh, we Oh, bless are. your heart. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, look, I know, and it's not a question of, of trying to tip the scales. Do you think someone stood out last night? You know, I think for me, the guy that I think stood out was Ron DeSantis. Okay, uh, why? I think he's upped his game since the other yeah. days. You know, he he he. It's knows. interesting, by the way, because David Axelrod said that, and then a bunch of people on the right said that, and it's it was interesting to see how there was sort of a a general agreement. And again, it wasn't a bad good. It was just hey, he he upped his game. Well put. He, he's up. He's upped his game, and he really he got was more aggressive, and he got he never got trapped by Haley. Haley. Several times tried to get him back yeah. in a trap, and he always was just like, "No, I did this." Right. Bam! You're like, so I think it was a very good debate for him. Um, uh, Haley does is always does well on a debate stage, right? Like it, it suits oh. her personality, her her quick one-liners back. Um, she, you know, that's always good for her. the two guys on the two ends, like the fighting back and forth. I think I think the, well, I I think ask the candidates that. got stuck talking to each other instead of talking to the American people. Right, Freeland, Chairman mentions. Uh, how you guys handle things in Alabama, much sure. more polite. Uh, I asked Vivek this morning about his style. How does that sure. go over with young people? Yeah, well, I'll tell you this. So the chairman and I uh, hosted an after party last night. Right oh, after thanks the for the yeah. invite. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is embarrassing. 
<laughs> what, what, what else are you guys doing? We'll we'll next night. I just, <laughs> this is awkward. We did get the memo that we'll match uh, yeah, back thank you back yeah. so We did pass that. Yeah, so we, we coordinated the state party and our youth council, you know, coordinated right. on this after party. It was filled with young voters from all across the state and some, you know, students here at the university. And I asked them, not, you know, not as a reporter, right. just a curiosity. What were your thoughts? And they said they didn't like the two in. They didn't like the going at each other. They felt that we as a country should be able to have a discussion, go into an opening statement of just talking about what are the best you know, yeah. credentials of your candidacy. And we saw it right off the gate in the opening statement. It's funny because I, online, I said this to Vivek this morning, yeah. a lot of conservative activists, grassroots activists, right, really were saying, go for it, Vivek, right? I just, again, this is not, from an analytical standpoint, be, having been in Iowa, growing up in New England, for a lot of older voters, which is where those caucus goers and primary goers come from, that demographic, I don't know that that sits well with them. I get it. He, People who are not used to, uh, who don't like the establishment, who want change, I bet you they loved what he had to say. But I just go, I don't know that a lot of older voters that make up the co the primary system in New Hampshire and the caucuses in Iowa are going to are going to respond to that. Yeah. yeah. Sean, we're 39 days out from the Iowa caucus. I mean, we're, it's really, really coming up to the time. This was the last debate before the end of the year. I think I agree with the chairman. I think Ron DeSantis stood out the most because he can run on his message of the platform of Florida and everything he's accomplished there as opposed to just zingers after, after, after each other. Well, I've always wondered, by the way, I've done uh, the state party dinner uh, last year, I think it was. Very supportive of President Trump, but that was before all the candidates. Is it, do you think, there, what is the, the percentage makeup, do you think, of, of the Alabama uh, activists, Trump versus the other candidates? I mean, look, this is Alabama, and, and, and I'm just going to be honest about it. Yeah, so um, well, that's what we and, and, I, and I really think, look, look. Appreciate that. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go back to Vivek just for a second okay. if I can, because we actually hosted him um, last uh, night before last. Yeah, I heard. Um, great event. And, and look, wasn't Vivek, invited to that either, by the way. <laughs> Vivek brings up some really, really good points. He really does. Yes, like, like, he's a smart guy. I, and, and look, he talks about things no one else is talking right. about. I respect that. Like, and that's what debates are about. I actually think Vivek is stronger. Like, he was stronger the night before the debate when he had time to, to speak for 15, 20 right. minutes straight. You, you come across with just so much more content than on a debate stage. So, well, you can elaborate, right? You're not, yes. when you're, I could watch those guys when the, I didn't, I mean, obviously I can't see what they saw, but they have a clock that says 90 seconds. And when you know it's winding down, you're like, da, 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 right? You, you have to get it all out sure. versus having the time to mm -hmm. really lay out an argument. And, and the elephant in the room, Donald Trump. So, <laughs> so we had DeSantis in March right. for our winter dinner. We had Trump at our summer dinner. We had Vivek the night before last. And I'm just going to tell you, here in Alabama, the people of Alabama have a special relationship with Donald Trump. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's, it's the way it's going to be. It's the way it is. Um, our state loves Donald Trump. I, I think if you're talking about activists, 60, 70 percent are, are right. Trump. So when you guys have that contest uh, on Super Tuesday, you think, I mean, Trump is. is I, I think it's going to be, Trump will be the leading candidate in my yeah. in Alabama. I, I, don't, I don't see any way that anyone, anyone passes him in the next year. Look, Trump has kept the lead for four years. You know, traditionally in a presidential cycle, you're like, okay, you want to peak at the right time, right? You, you know, because because people usually get tired of the front runner, and then someone else overtakes, and it's it's you want to be the front runner on uh, during the primary, you know, yeah. January, February, March. Trump has been the front runner for four years. I don't see anything in the next three months that's going to change that. What were your big takeaways last night? Brent? Well, I'll, I'll say this as for for Trump comment. Um, as he mentioned, the president was just here. He was here in August. I, you know, got to meet with him backstage beforehand. They, we set an attendance record here in the state of Alabama. That was the largest attended state party dinner. That's huge. That right. shows how much support the former president has still in here in Alabama, even without being here this weekend. Major takeaway, if you ask me who won this debate, I'd say Megyn Kelly. I think right really? out of the debate, yes, her question, Why? it was so good. I turned to the, the guy that was sitting next to me. The very first question of the entire debate was to Ron DeSantis. She said, look, you're the, you were the shining right, star no, of the yeah, party. about electability. Exactly, electability, which is the question we've all been wondering wondering secretly, but nobody's asked him. But and don't you said, think it's of all of them? I, I think yeah. Sean Spicer should have been on the panel, though. Like, <laughs> that's my, been, that's yeah. my you know what, Well, this is debate. you trying to make up for not inviting me to the big after party. <laughs> and look, look, uh, I, I didn't get to be chairman for nothing. Like, yeah, you know, you gotta, smart you gotta, move. Yeah. What, what, what didn't you hear last night? I mean, really, you talked about what we did hear. Um, what, what didn't you hear? What issue do you think Republican voters didn't hear about? Two things for me. Yeah. One is I would have liked to see some more questions uh, about youth. Yes. And we were on a college campus first debate this. But why? Let me ask campus. you this. Okay, although I'll do respect to Riley, like, why? Because they're not Iowa. I've said everything matters in Iowa. Old people everything. vote. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> but it's not just old people vote. And I'm being serious, though. Is that, to me, I, I think we waste too many questions on 
issues that don't move the needle, right? So again, I, I love the youth enthusiasm that you've brought, uh, that so many others uh, on this campus morning. But my point is, you're not going to be the nominee if you don't make it out of Iowa, New Hampshire. So telling me that there's a big enough constituency of young people is nice, but is it going to matter? Well, for me, this, this was an opportunity for, as a fourth debate, right? Okay. We've already had three, fourth debate on college campus. Do one round of questions on youth. Yeah. Okay. And, and look, the bottom line is, what would make America better for youths makes America better for everyone. Well, we did get a question on student debt and student loans. Yeah. yeah. And I thought Vivek handled that really well, tying that, or was it Ron DeSantis, or that tied it to your loan Sanders, having the yes. university have some skin in the game, yes. which is good. We didn't even bring up the fa those university presidents, though, they which I thought. Once. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately. Well, what else? See, I, to me, the, the big issue that was missed, and, and I see this all the time, and I, I don't know if it's consultants or, or where, where's, who's missing this. You know, Democrats are attempting to use the issue of abortion and yeah. hit Republicans over the head with it, right? You, they say we have trouble with middle class, you know, middle class, middle aged women. Um, well, we've seen what the answer to that is on our side. It's parental rights and school choice. We saw it in, in, in Glenn Youngkin's race in Virginia. Right. Ron DeSantis winning Florida by 20 points. Yep. Republicans need to be talking about those issues. That's our that's our hammer on the yep. Democrats, and they're hitting us, and we're not. But I, I think that's right. There's too many times that we're not communicating. What about you? Yes. Well, Sean, let me say this. I've been on the campus all week. I live here, but I've been walking around talking to people. What we've heard from young people is they're excited that we actually came here. We're excited that we gave them the opportunity yeah. because on the other side, they're having a coronation with Joe Biden. They just you know kind of propped him up there. They don't do debates. We're actually giving them the option to speak directly to the candidates. Viva Cross Swan was doing laps running around this quad the other day. Ron DeSantis did a rally right out there by the quad. He's actually, they're actually on the campus being accessible. No, I get it, I get it. In this good. debate, I'll tell you this, and you know you know statistics better than anybody. We had a thousand seat capacity last night. We had over 7,000 enrolled students at the University of Alabama request tickets. Young That's people great. are no, I, I think Look, I get it, I think it's great. Yes. I'm just saying, I, and I, I want more people, believe me, we need more young people. It, it's the job of the party. To, I know. Young people, the candidates you, are looking for you're votes, doing a great right? job yes, there, Chairman. Yeah. All right, Chairman John Wall, Breland Holly. Hand. Thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks I, again. Thank you to the University of Alabama for hosting us for News Nation for making this look so beautiful. We'll be back tomorrow. We've got a great conversation with Logan Seculo. You know his dad. He's the attorney that defended Donald Trump in that impeachment trial. He's got a brand new Christmas movie out. We're going to break down because there's some familiar faces in that. Thanks for watching. Continue to subscribe. By the way, if you're listening on audio, go to YouTube and Rumble and check out the beautiful shots that we have. Thanks to the drone operator for some amazing overhead things. We'll see you back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.